So here are a couple of hints for the problems 78 and 79 on our homework that relate to working with the definitions of open sets, closed sets, interior, and closure. So problem 78 asks you to consider an open set A and a closed set B. And the question here is, what can we say about the set difference A minus B and B minus A? Do those have to be open? Do those have to be closed? Or possibly not? So just remember what set differences are. The difference of uh, A minus B is all those points which are in A but which are not in B. And conversely, B minus A is the points that are in B but not in A. And I think the key to an expedient solution to this problem is to reframe your understanding of the set difference using an intersection instead. Remember that by definition, A minus B is the intersection of A with the complement of B and likewise for b minus a. So the question you might ask yourself here is, what do we know about the sets a and the set b complement, given what we know about a and b? And then based on that knowledge, what can we say about the intersection of those two sets? And feel free to use a theorem here and not reinvent the wheel. What do we know about how the topology of the intersection of two sets is related to the topology of the original sets? For the next problem, you're asked to show how the interior and closure operations on sets uh, relate when we apply the union operation or the intersection operation. So in the first problem in this uh, two, if I take two sets E1 and E2, and I take the union of their interiors, so all the interior points of E1 together with all the interior points of E2, you're supposed to show that that set is a subset of the interior of the union of E1 with E2. In other words, if I know either that a point is an interior point of E1 or that it's an interior point of E2, I need to show that that point is an interior point of the union of E1 with E2. On the closure side, we do it instead with intersection. So remember that the closure of a set is the set taken together with all of its accumulation points. So we take all the accumulation points of the set and we throw them in along with the elements of the set and we get the closure. So here, if I take the closure of the intersection, I want to show that it's a subset of the intersection of the closures. In other words, if I have a point which is either an element or an accumulation point of the intersection of E1 with E2, I need to show that it is both an accumulation point of E1 or an element of E1 and an accumulation point of E2 or an element of E2. We're going to unpack those um, just a little bit more. In each of these examples, we have to prove something about a containment of two sets. We can't prove something about a containment of two sets without making an argument about the elements of those sets. And you can't make an argument about elements if you don't use an element argument. So use an element argument. And each of the element arguments in this proof is going to involve us picking an element from one side of the set containment sign and then showing that that is also an element on the other side of the set containment sign. So for our first example, we're going to pick an element x that belongs to the union of the interiors of E1 and E2. And we want to then show that x is an element of the set on the left, the interior of the union of E1 with E2. Now, because we're choosing our x to belong to a union, that suggests that our proof will have to proceed in two different cases. The first case, where x belongs to the interior of E1, and the second case, where x belongs to the interior of E2. So you might need to do those cases separately, but in fact the logic is going to be exactly the same because this whole statement is actually symmetric with respect to an interchange of the sets E1 and E2. So your two cases are going to look identical in the proof, uh, which means you can either write them as identical or you can say something like, without loss of generality, let's assume X belongs to E1, the argument is uh, parallel for E2. So then what does that argument actually look like? Let's say that we're in case one, where we choose that x belongs to the interior of E1. So x is an interior point of E1, meaning, by definition, x has some breathing room inside of E1. There exists a real number c that's positive, such that the open interval x minus c to x plus c is a subset of E1. So if x has breathing room in E1, we need to know why does it therefore have breathing room inside of the union of E1 with E2. So if x can stretch out its arms inside of this red set, how do we know that x can stretch out its arms inside of the purple set? And I think the picture kind of gives away why this argument is not particularly intricate to make. Um, it just has to do with how we define the union of two sets. For the second problem, 
our containment sign is going the other direction here, so we need to choose an element on the set on the left. So let x be an element of the closure of E1 intersect E2. So it's in the closure of the intersection. We want to show why x, therefore, both is an element of the closure of E1 and it's an element of the closure of E2. So now we know what our task is. Now remember what closure is. Closure is defined as the union of a set with its accumulation points. That means that there's two ways that an element can belong to the closure of a set A. It can be an element of A to begin with, or it can be an accumulation point of A, which remember doesn't necessarily have to be an element of A in the first place. Right? So those are the two different sort of ways to belong to the closure. And so in our proof, we are going to need to consider both of those two different ways. Because we're starting by choosing an element x which belongs to the closure of E1 intersect E2. That means that there's one case in which x is actually an element of that set, E1 intersect E2. And the question then is, given that x is an element of the intersection, why does x belong to the closure of E1? In particular, which of these two criteria will x satisfy in relation to the set E1? If you can show that it satisfies either of these two criteria, then you've shown that x belongs to the closure of E1. The second case then, and this is the one that will take a little bit more work than the first, we assume that x is an accumulation point of E1 intersect E2. This is the other way that x can belong to the closure. So then the question is, again, how do we know that x is going to belong to the closure of E1? And then you'll also have to explain why it belongs to the closure of E2. Okay. Hopefully these sort of skeletons of these proofs will help you to set them up in ways that are, that are useful. Um, and by the way, just to connect this with other work that we've done uh, in this particular packet, the fact that the interiors, the union of the interiors is a subset of the interiors of the unions um, actually relates to the argument for why the union of two open sets is itself an open set. This was the question four on the eighth group assignment in the course. And likewise, this statement about closures helps us to argue why the intersection of two closed sets is itself a closed set. And also, incidentally, both of these set containments in this problem actually also go the other way. Uh, the interior of the union is actually equal to the union of the interiors, and the closure of the intersection is actually equal to the intersection of the closures. But I'm not asking you to prove both directions in this homework problem. You only need to prove the one. And I think that in each case, this one happens to be um, the slightly less trivial uh, direction of the corresponding arguments.